Okay, so uh, welcome uh, everyone to this last day of this series of exciting talks. So today our first speaker is uh, Dibbendu Das from IIT Bombay. Uh, his title of the talk is The Protein Hourglass, Fast Passage Time Distributions for Protein Thresholds. So, uh, okay, Dibbendu, so the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you, Dibjyoti. Good morning, everybody. So um, as uh, Dibjyoti already read out, this uh, talk is about uh, accumulation of proteins in uh, cells and their number or concentration crossing a th threshold and uh, thereby uh, some uh, in important uh, biological event may be triggered. Uh, so one is interested in such a process. This work was headed by my graduate student Krishna Rijal uh, and uh, I and my collaborator Ashok Prasad assisted. Um, so, uh, what is what is first passage? So, um, the basic idea of first passage, uh, you go back to this uh, sort of textbookish picture where uh, you have a drunk person uh, who is uh, moving in some random fashion in the middle of the night uh, through the empty streets and well by chance may hit a lamppost and fall down. Now, if he has a sober companion who can record how much time was taken uh, from the point where he started, which is this blue point, and the point where he ended, which is the red point, then that time, recorded time, will be called as a first passage time. Now, of course, you know, in physics and biology, we are not dealing with drunk persons, but uh, I will give a few examples from our own work, which may show where these kind of ideas come up. Of course, it's a vast subject and I can't do justice by, you know, it's, it's impossible for me to kind of review within a, a talk because so much work has happened on first passage and all that. So here, for example, you know, instead of the drunk person, you have a um, camphor uh, coated paper particle, which acts as a self-propel particle on the surface of water uh, driven by Marangoni forces and executes uh, a noisy circular motion uh, but suppose it is, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, surrounded by a lot of passive crowders. Uh, it, it executes uh, some sort of random motion and at the end of the day may reach the periphery. So this is some kind of first passage. And uh, the target here is the whole, uh, you know, boundary of the Petri dish. Um, here you see the promoter region of uh, mm, uh, the 4-5 uh, uh, gene in East. And uh, suppose you think of the Tata binding protein, which has to bind to a Tata box or a transcription factor like 4-4, which has to bound, bind to a UA site one or two. Uh, in that case, they have to find a window, in the, uh, a time window when uh, such a site would be uh, not occluded by the otherwise dynamic nucleosomes. And to find that site for the first time, or you know, covering it uh, a patch of DNA for the first time again becomes a first passage process. Um, uh, we have also looked at, and this problem gets more involved. Uh, that is the search of uh, kinetochore by microtubules, and if there are, um, uh, you know, there can be various mechanisms. Search and capture. You heard about that uh, during seminars in this conference. And also, for example, in interesting things like uh, rot merely rotational diffusion of the microtubules as in fission yeast and all that. But the point here, uh, what is interesting is that unlike the drunk person or the, um, um, you know, um, uh, here in this camphor boat case, the boundary, or in the case of that, um, you know, Tata box, where we usually consider the target to be stationary in case of the kinetochore capture the kinetochore itself has to be regarded as a moving target that makes the problem enormously difficult and uh, like the uh, actual problem of uh, moving targets with multiple searchers for example is an unsolved uh, analytically unsolved problem for 20 25 years and we made some headway numerically recently and if interested you may have a look okay now let us let me move on to the main theme of the talk okay so um, uh, so this is about uh, the virus lambda phage infecting the bacteria E. coli and um, associated or uh, after the infection happens, there is uh, the accumulation of a protein called holine, which uh, helps in damaging the cell membrane and uh, uh, this event called lysis to happen by which basically the uh, 
viruses that are produced, the virions that are produced, they, those are thrown out in the media. Okay, so uh, in the next few slides, I, I'm, I will build up this story of uh, Holin's, how does Holin come in and what is Lambda Fudge doing? And you will see there are many issues that are all important, but at the end of the day, we'll try to reduce it to something of a simple story. So let us go step by step and see what are these complications which uh, we would like to for the time being ignore, but nevertheless, they are very important and they are there. So first and foremost, the Lambda Fudge is not a, I mean, as, uh, so all, Vi viruses which infect bacteria are called bacteriophages, but this lambda fudge is called a temperate fudge. And it actually can go in two of the pathways, lysis as well as lysogeny. We are interested in lysis, but what does this virus do? Uh, so there is a, here is a sort of um, schematic picture from this paper in cell, where you can see these green viruses, they come inside the body of the bacteria after infection. They, if they go to the lytic pathway, they will increase their number. As you see, their numbers are increasing um, in the lytic pathway. And uh, beyond some point, the uh, cell uh, membrane uh, disintegrates and these viruses are thrown out. On the other hand, it could also happen that this virus actually, um, its genome integrates with the genome of the bacteria and it produces a new bacteria, so to say, or called the lysogenic bacteria which has uh, normal cycles of growth and division. Uh, so thus the virus actually starts living uh, along with the bacteria uh, inside its body. It can choose to live thus in two different ways. And uh, more than a decade, you know, so many, many years, people have been uh, studying this uh, process that what is this uh, switch? When does it happen and what are the factors? So there are, I have listed various factors, you know, which cause this lysis lysogeny switch. Um, but uh, for today's talk, the, those are not important. Why they are not important? Because the kind of experiments I will be focusing on uh, in the last, uh, you know, 10, uh, uh, 15 years or so, those have been actually doing uh, something like this. They take a lysogenic bacteria and they do what is called a thermal induction, a heat treatment by which they uh, set the bacteria in the path of lysis. So then, uh, you know, the lytic st uh, cycle starts and uh, after some time, lysis happens. So you see all the time that it was uncertain in the decision-making of the virus, whether the bacteria and the virus will go in this pathway of lysis and lysogeny is now eliminated, okay? So by this method and uh, what uh, the thermal induction of the lysogenic bacteria, what the experimentalist is ensuring is a precise T is equal to zero. That is time is equal to zero. Uh, the clock is being set when the lysis is starting. So, so one of the complication is gone, gone. We don't have to uh, worry about the lysis lysogeny switch. Then comes the question that, well, I mean, it has gone into the lytic pathway. The viruses are being produced and they can go on produce for, producing forever. Uh, by the way, um, um, it is interesting that once uh, the lytic cycle starts, after 20 minutes of that, actually all the machinery of the bacteria to uh, cell divide is um, stopped. So, you know, uh, it is, uh, E. coli is not going to have uh, the usual cycle of uh, division anymore. Uh, so the virus can go on, uh, you know, being produced, but then uh, at some point uh, we uh, naturally see lysis happening. And that is because there is this protein called choline, which plays a very important role. So let us get into the story of choline and endolysis. What are those? So here is the gene of the lambda fudge, uh, a part of the gene uh, uh, genome, and where you see the late promoter PR prime controlling these genes S and R. And uh, so this S uh, gene actually produces um, so here <clears throat> you can see the mRNA sequence and it produces two proteins, S105 and S107. From the same uh, thing, there are actually two start codons which produce these two proteins. And one is called a holine, that is the S105, and the other S107 is the anti-holine. And the anti-holine actually suppresses the, the, uh, the action of the holine. The holine is this protein that actually corrodes the membrane, produces lesion. Uh, and anti-holing kind of uh, deactivates, so to say, its activity. It's a kind of control. 
But then, you know, if holins have to act, they have to be in excess. And that is what experimentalists find, found. Holins are uh, two is to one ratio uh, than anti-holins. And in fact, this experiment was so precise as to even count that in wild type, how many number of total holins are there? How many number of anti-holins? How many number of holin proteins uh, typically are necessary for lysis to happen? And I will uh, tell you the number in the next slide. But before that, let me also tell a bit about the endolysin. So from the uh, gene R, you have this protein endolysin, which is uh, shown in brown here. Uh, and in this cartoon, this is a very recent paper, which uh, gave this cartoon. So I borrowed it uh, because it becomes easy to understand. So these holins uh, molecules, they come, uh, they dimerize and they deposit uh, you know, on the inner membrane of the bacteria. And at some point, at some suitable point, and I'll come to this point business a little later, uh, it produces this cut, this lesion. And then this endolysin, um, they uh, go out of these cuts and they attack the peptidoglycan layer and the outer membrane, and then they burst open the bacteria. So you see, uh, all these factors are there. There is endolysin, there is antiholin. But at the end of the day, you see what we have to worry about, excess holin over antiholin. And once the holin has done its action, the endolysin action is immediate. So basically, we can forget from the story endolysin and antiholin for the time being. Although they are there, the story can be made simpler. Let's focus on the excess holin. But then that uh, does not stop our worry because you know the a biophysicist would wonder that these proteins they dimerize, they oligomerize, they form uh, wraps. At the end of the day, they form clusters, and maybe. Maybe that this uh, lysis happens when there is a critical size of the cluster. That was the thinking uh, up until uh, to, uh, 2010 and all that. But then there was an experiment which put that picture to rest. What it found was that these holins actually spread on the membrane very uniformly up to some time. So here what you can see is that up to 93 minutes, these, these holin proteins are sprayed all uniformly on the surface. And in one minute, they suddenly cluster and then they uh, cause this, uh, you know, lethal action. So the uh, picture that has emerged now, it is like that these uh, things, uh, you know, within uh, a, a minute uh, actually uh, forms this cluster. So this raft size uh, formation, all the biophysical steps are, are not that important. One can sort of say it has come to the domain where people can do reaction, uh, uh, sort of stochastic reactions and all that. That is, when is the number basically rising and going beyond the point? You don't have to get into much details of what is the structure doing. Okay. And so what was the number that uh, they, so experimentally it was found that uh, for wild type, the number, excess in number should be about 1500. While the lysis time, it is, uh, you know, for the, for the wild type, about 65 minutes plus minus, that is the standard deviation is about 3.2 minutes. Now out of the 65 minutes, the first 15 minutes, nothing happens. This is the time when, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a um, sort of quiescent period in which no holin is produced. And then the holin starts being produced. The number goes from zero to this capital X within about 50 minutes. Now, please remember these 50 minutes and the standard deviation I'm talking about, which is about 3.5 3 and all that, and uh, the number 1500, because later on when I will come to mathematical theories, this will be useful. And then uh, <clears throat> now the question is that, well, if people know so well the numbers, then uh, what is it that further we have to do? Well, uh, you know, they, here comes two different perspectives. So one perspective is that, well, this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, holin crossing a threshold and the triggering of lysis is a precise process. So if you look at the titles of these papers that uh, holins, the protein clocks of bacteriophage infection, that's the impression you get. It's a very precise process. But on the other hand, there are papers whose titles will tell it is not so, uh, pre not so precise too. I mean, there are stochasticities. So how do you control, for example, this timing and all that? So these papers would tell you the factors influencing lysis time stochasticity or, uh, you know, the stochastic holin expression can account for lysis time variation. So this is where our interest comes because, you know, if there is some randomness, some stochasticity, one can start thinking uh, how to mathematically model those. And now can, um, uh, 
how how do how do the experimentalists actually control and engineer the mean first passage time and uh, let's say the the fluctuations of these times well i mean the of course you know bacterial growth rate can be varied the uh, promoter uh, pr prime activity can be varied but most importantly what the experimentalists have managed to do very successfully is take a host of uh, holin mutants you know the genetically modified uh, um, uh, sort of uh, mutants uh, that are there, they will produce uh, altered amino acid sequences such that uh, the holine addition to the membrane is altered. And as a result, their lethal action can be controlled. Uh, the timing can be controlled. And I will give you this very recent uh, picture, uh, this recent graph from a paper um, that has appeared where 20 different mutants have been used you see 20 different data points here. Uh, and those, uh, the mean first passage time can go from about 25 minutes to 170 or 180 minutes. On the other hand, the CV square, you know, CV square is noise, which is um, variance divided by mean square. That thing can vary over 10, uh, factor of 10, you know, from 0.01 to 0.10. So uh, then there uh, seems to be for people like us a little hope that you know the, the stochastic time, its mean and fluctuations are being varied quite a lot by the experimentalists. So one can look into the stochastic process more carefully. And, uh, but you know, there, are, there is the other viewpoint. If you show this graph to some people who like to think of this pro uh, process as very precise, they will tell, I don't care about all this variation. Look, the minimum is there. Minimum is where the wild type is there. So they will tell, look, the lysis is and it optimizes um, for the wild type lambda because the noise is a minimum. And this kind of view, you know, I just, although I will not get into, uh, there was a paper in 20, uh, 2006, quite interesting, which tried to claim that if you look at these mutant fitnesses, now, uh, you know, the uh, different mutants, the viruses, they are going out in the medium. So you do separate experiments with them and you find their fitness, that is their growth rates in the medium. And you, what they claimed is that if the lysis time varies, in that case, the, the fitness is the maximum for the time scales that people see in, uh, in wild type lambda. But well, I mean, let's not, as I said, that my interest is not in the precision, but rather in the imprecision. And hence, we would be interested in the gene expression, the noisy, intrinsic uh, sort of, uh, you know, fluctuations and uh, the full statistics of it. So here is the mathematical formulation of the problem. Uh, so, um, uh, as you know, in this very uh, rather uh, famous paper, Shadaja Iswain, they uh, looked at uh, the forward master equation for the probability that the, there are n proteins at time t. And in this, uh, um, uh, means this equation was written under the understanding or the approximation that the mRNAs, when uh, they quickly degrade, producing a burst of proteins, and uh, then the proteins are fairly long-lived compared to the mRNAs. Under that approximation, you don't have to write a probability for both mRNA number and the protein number, but merely the uh, protein number. So in this, uh, you know, uh, just schematically for um, those who are not familiar with this to observe that uh, there, is, there are these incoming turns. As you go from time t to t plus dt, what is happening is that you can come into the uh, state with n proteins from n plus one by degradation. So there is this gamma denotes the degradation rate. On the other hand, you can come to the state n from all sorts of states that are below it, that is with zero protein also, you can jump to n proteins with one, with two, with n minus one. Of course, it will be easy for you to jump from n minus one. And that is why the rates are multiplied by this exponentially uh, distributed or rather uh, in the discrete form, it's called geometrically distributed um, uh, factor, which is b to the power r, b plus one to the power r plus one. So as R increases, of course, this goes down very fast exponentially. Where did this exponential distribution come from? Well, uh, the, uh, two years before this, experimentally, uh, you know, by Friedman, Sanisi, their group, they found that uh, proteins actually are produced in bursts, and they are, uh, the burst mean burst size is B, while the protein burst size X is distributed exponentially. And for this uh, equation, which is the Fokker Planck equation is the analog of this discrete equation that Sarah Zeiss Swain wrote two years later. And it is quite well known that if you look at the steady state 
uh, of this uh, of this uh, process that is del p del t is equal to zero then you get the gamma distribution of the proteins and this is quite well known that you know proteins are distributed as gamma distributions in uh, in steady state in cells quite often okay so this is all about the protein number but i am not interested in that i am interested rather in the question that the protein number has to cross a threshold capital x for the first time and what is the time okay in that and what is the statistics of that so this uh, problem was solved in this very nice paper uh, by uh, abudai singh uh, and denehi in 2017 in which they actually worked out the mean and variance for this mean first passage times and their answer was um uh, pretty general for uh, uh, any degradation that is uh, not just zero degradation but you know short lived long lived proteins uh, with uh, gamma not equal to zero gamma equal to zero moreover they solved it for any independence of the protein production rate now this is very important uh, you should understand that in this uh, maybe i can go back uh, once uh, here this k in you see the rate uh, at which the transcription and then the protein production happens uh, this rate is function of the protein level from which it is starting so if for example that thing does not depend on in then there is no feedback otherwise if it is depending on the in then there is an auto regulation if k in increases within it's a positive uh, feedback if k in decreases within that is a negative feedback okay so having solved that problem they uh, they could make very interesting conclusions they said that uh, you know if there is no feedback then they could show they could cal I mean, their calculations showed that the noise in the system was a minimum for no feedback so they said that the holin proteins actually uh, should not have any auto regulation according to i mean it, it's kind of theoretically expected on the other hand the proteins which degrade fast should have um, uh, noise minimized with positive feedback and all that so you if you have a mathematical formula all these interesting things can be predicted but our interested was the full distribution and this is where our work comes in uh, so uh, we uh, address this through what is called the negative Uh, sorry the backward formalism and the backward form formalism uh, so you can of course address the problem through the forward formalism also but it is more uh, involved and cumbersome rather the backward is a little more elegant because you straight away get what is called a survival probability that you start with n proteins and up until time t the protein level is below x okay so that quantity is snt that the protein has survived Uh, not to have reached the threshold x and it is called a backward equation because uh, here if you go from t to t plus delta t you are going in the past that is you have survived for a longer time okay in that sense it is backward and if you understand that then you have to just realize that coming from t plus delta t that is in the past to t which is future uh, what has happened the n uh, state could have gone to n plus 1 n plus 2 and all the way to x or x plus 1 if it has crossed x plus 1 of course the survival probability is zero so anyway once one writes such an equation one can cast it into a vector matrix form why a vector because this s n which is the which has this index n uh, this n could be from 0 to x minus 1 so you can stack it up into a vector and you can write this equation and then there is a matrix you are not really interested in all n but n is equal to 0 so at the end of the day we are interested in s 0 t and i have written capital x also in the subscript to remind that the threshold is capital x okay but then the important thing is that when you once you know the survival probability you can calculate the first passage as the derivative of the survival probability and that's uh, the standard thing so the idea is to solve this equation for the survival probability and get the first passage the technical details if anybody is interested is that you actually use the laplace transform to solve this and there are two challenges in the problem first to find this inverse matrix which is x cross x and then after you found uh, find the laplace transform to find the inverse laplace transform okay so what we have managed to do is actually find this inverse matrix and as well as invert the laplace transform for zero degradation that is for long lived proteins we have the full answer but for short lived proteins that is 
degradation gamma not equal to zero, we only have the Laplace transform. We have not been able to invert it. Okay, so I will show you answers. Our results, are, which are suitable for holine, and this is good that for holine is long-lived protein, it does not degrade. So this is the uh, full answer for the first passage distribution in time. What you see here is uh, some power series in time. Uh, multiplied by an exponential, okay? And uh, this is without any feedback when the rates are independent of n. On the other hand, if you are having uh, Kn, that is the protein level dependent rates of production of protein, that is, if you have autoregulation positive or negative, then this is the answer. Uh, so um, now one aspect I would like you to observe is that typically when uh, in, uh, you are just doing mean and variance, you might even think that a distribution is a Gaussian. And, but you, here you see that it's explicit expressions have exponential tails. Uh, these are non-Gaussian. So our first curiosity was that, well, people have been, uh, have been having all these data for long, and they, if it was too much different from Gaussian, they would have uh, reported. Uh, so uh, what is going on? So we wanted to first compare it with the data. So the experimental values of it. So you have uh, three, four minutes. Yes, I will be okay. finishing. Okay. I think uh, I may take two minutes extra, but I started, uh, you know, two minutes later. So I think you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, um, uh, so the experimental value of X uh, is uh, uh, known. Fifteen hundred. I told you the lice, mean lysis time and the standard deviation is known. And the theoretical formula actually involves these constants, capital X, B, and K. So, if you know these experimental numbers, you can work back what is B and K. So the, the mean birth size is about three and uh, the, uh, if the rate uh, of production is taken to be constant, that is without autoregulation, the number turns out to be 10 per minute. And uh, here uh, is the experimental data from Denehi and Singh in the uh, bar graph and here is the theoretical curve. So it looks pretty Gaussian and we wanted to confirm that. Uh, so here we have put with the same parameters, the dashed line is the Gaussian curve. You see, after all these, you know, finding the exact distribution, it does not, uh, at least with the ex available experimental data, it is not very different from the Gaussian. And this can be seen also by looking at the higher cumulants. If you look at the skewness, uh, the Gaussian of course is zero, but uh, experiment has a small one. 0 0.06 and our theory would predict this. And uh, Kurtos is also a slight deviation from three, which is the Gaussian value. But the advantage of having an analytical formula is now we can uh, start telling that what should be the parameter values. And I told you the experimentalists are now in a position to produce various uh, holine mutants. So it may be possible that one can play around with the numbers K and B and uh, uh, we uh, sort of predict that you can have three times higher skewness if the number K and B is made 10 times different. Okay, so uh, uh, now uh, I should, uh, I, as I mentioned that if uh, the, there is a non-zero degradation, then we have this Laplace transform as our result. Now, what is the difficulty of inverting it? Well, if you look at the denominator, it, it has a polynomial of very high degree of X and that uh, the, to find the exact roots of that is a challenge. And that is where we are stuck at this moment. And, uh, but at the same time with the Laplace transform, you can take derivatives and find moments of any higher order. So, so far in the literature, people knew only up to second moment. We have calculated the third moment also. It's a very long answer spanning over a page, but uh, we have the answer for you know, third moment and the skewness of this distribution. Okay, uh, the last point before I conclude, I want to uh, sort of say is that one may have even with zero degradation, and this is a in, sort of interesting side observation, with zero degradation also, you can have a non-monotonic behavior of the noise provided there is negative feedback. So this is the picture shown that CV square as a function of the protein threshold actually has this non-monotonic behavior. And this will surprise, surprise you because you know, uh, usually non-monotonic behavior, and this has been reported in the literature by both the Nehi's group as well as Almaco's, uh, this French work um, in 2017. And 
they have a non-monotonicity when they have degradation. Because with degradation, the system reaches a steady state. And because you have a steady state, if you are fixing thresholds higher or comparable to the steady state, the system finds it very difficult to reach there. And as a result, the noise rises faster than the, uh, uh, you know, uh, so the mean value, uh, the fluctuations rises. And as a result, the noise rises. But uh, in the, with the negative feedback, uh, with linear feedback, for example, also there is a somewhat trivial, but nevertheless a steady state. Because, you know, if you have a negative linear feedback, uh, you, you will actually at some point have zero rate of production. So the proteins will accumulate, there will be a steady state. So that is the reason why this may, uh, you know, then you can understand why this would happen. But also with hill functions, with high, high hill coefficient, because the rates are falling to very, very small values, you can have the noise upturn. So if you want to look at the Monte Carlo, traces, this is where it is. If the protein level is uh, small, you have large noise, then small noise and large noise at the points A, B, and C. So I can conclude now. We obtained the full first passage distribution for the long-lived proteins like choline, that is the degradation rate gamma equal to zero. For short-lived proteins, that is gamma not equal to zero, we have exact expressions for Laplace transform of the distribution. Uh, the skewness and uh, the departure from Gaussianity is not discernible with the current data, but if one can engineer various rates, uh, we can predict where one may expect the distortion from the Gaussian. Uh, the uh, long-lived uh, proteins too uh, should have a non-monotonic behavior of CV, something that uh, is a small thing that we observed. Uh, and finally, uh, we did, all, I presented all results with discrete uh, analysis, that is the discrete number of proteins and all that, but people often are interested, like you, you saw the classic Sunizi paper, which was talking about the concentration of the proteins. So what is concentration X is protein number divided by volume. So you then require a continuous approach to this problem. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, we have actually worked through uh, that continuous formalism and uh, for gamma equal to zero, uh, we have exact answer uh, what will happen to the distribution of the first passage time. And interestingly, uh, the, if you take the discrete answer that I showed you already, and if you make the protein burst be large and the threshold large, then one can show that the discrete answer will go over in a limit to the continuum answer. But I will not get into that because some things are going on on that and possibly we'll, we'll separately publish that. So uh, thank you for your attention and I would be happy to take questions now. Okay, Dibendu, very nice talk. Uh, I have just one question. Uh, so as far as the model is concerned, the discrete model, yeah. uh, what is the difference between your model and the model developed by Abhuda, uh, Gusinga and Denehi? Ah, so what Abudai uh, did was they took the forward formalism, that the forward master equation, mm -hmm. and they directly write the first passage as a summation formula where you have the probability of a protein of a particular level i multiplied by the rate that the burst will go above capital X. And mm -hmm. then you sum that. So mm -hmm. in their formalism, basically, they have to know the probability of the protein at a particular time which comes from the forward formalism. So, uh, and uh, they use these to then go and find just the first two moments of the distribution. They write a general formula for any moment, but they can calculate only up to the second moment because it gets involved, the calculation gets involved in the forward formalism. What we have done is if you go to the backward formalism where you get the survival probability directly and then by taking derivative get the first passage, we could uh, rather easily get the first passage directly, at least for the degradation equal to zero. So other, otherwise, it's like the same model only being talked in the forward versus the backward formalism. Our point was that if they would have tried the backward formalism, they would have got the answer a little more easily. Because sometimes, you know, mathematics is like yeah, yeah. easier. No, backward is always more convenient. Yeah, that, is, that, was, uh, that is the point we, and we got the distribution, which the full distribution they had not got. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the model is still the same. Model is exactly the same. It okay. is, in fact, the classic. In fact, they are also working with the uh, Sahrazai Swain model. Okay. That is the thing. Thank you.
Vashish, can I ask a question? This is Roop here. Yes. Hi, Dibindu. Roop here. Yes. So, uh, just a kind of, I'm trying to look at a population of bacteria which has been infected by, uh, let's say, this virus. So, yeah. your the tail that you mentioned, the long exponential tail, would mean that there would be some bacteria in which the lysis has not happened yet. Right? Would have you kind of modeled such a population where maybe the bacteria, you know, the virus does not want to lyse all the bacteria, then it gets out and then it gets degraded. You know, if you if you make a long tail, maybe you will still have when you come out later, you may still have some uninfected bacteria which you can infect and live on. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. It perfectly makes sense. Actually, uh, so uh, if you are doing a population study, which, you know, many of these uh, are done, uh, you know, the, the burst, uh, you know, distributions, so to say, uh, if you get into all these will become um, uh, an issue. Uh, see here, one is focusing on the burst time. So one is not really focusing that after the burst happens, then what happens, these viruses go out, they can reinfect and, you know, further things can happen. And moreover, uh, you know, how much is the size of the burst? That also uh, uh, remains as a very interesting open question because as you prolong the time, of course, you know, the burst sizes are also going to vary. So all those are there. But uh, uh, if I understand correctly, what you were just telling is that there would be all these complications once, you know, it comes out late and then... Uh, no, no, so, I'm not saying in the sense of complication. I am trying yeah. to understand what is a... Is this long tail a survival advantage for the virus in a population of bacteria which it has infected? And that's so, why it has a long tail. Ha, so that I will answer... Uh, from the study of Wang, 20, uh, 2006, uh, could you, um, maybe I, I should again go back to the screen sharing. Uh, uh, so uh, if you remember, I showed a graph in which there was a, uh, let me just scare, share the screen once more and uh, play this. So let me just go back. Uh, See, this graph I showed, this uh, paper, uh, 2006 by Wang, uh, in which what he is plotting is fitness versus lysis time. So hmm. this fitness, what he takes is that, and the precise definition that they use is that the uh, viral number after five hours divided by, I mean, log of the viral number after five hours divided by uh, the viral number after one hour and this whole thing divided by one by five. So, so basically the growth rate of the virus. Okay. okay. And yeah. so then they argue that virus, look, they, that has two kinds of advantages. One, if it bursts it early, then it goes out. It has the chance to reinfect bacteria. Right. right? Further. Right. So uh, it does uh, can bank on that advantage that early, if I have few viruses also going out, we all can uh, infect. But that is an uncertain thing because, you know, in the outside medium, it doesn't know what is waiting for it. On the other hand, it can stay inside the bacteria for long. And, and not lice. And not, and not uh, lice. And in the process, produce maybe hundreds of viriums and then go out. Then right. Right. somebody might say... Kind of what I was... Uh, exactly. So it might thinking. sort of think that, well, that is much more advantageous to me. Now it right. has to play a game to see where it can optimize. And uh, this if, experimental if, if, data is showing that for the wild type, where the mean lysis time is around 50 minutes, the measured experimental fitness seems to be at a maximum. Okay. okay. So that, that's what their claim was. But I did not see after that much study with this fitness. Because after I saw this paper, I was very interested that, you know, this should be followed up. But somehow I, I haven't seen. But that may be because I am, I, you know, I also don't follow that much of the experimental literature. I'm coming with a little bit mathematical interest. Thanks. Thanks, Dibindu. Yeah. Hey, Dibindu, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. A couple of questions. In fact, if you can go back to the same plot, that will be useful. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry about it. I uh, just... So I was just wondering, the plot that you showed of the variance in the noise versus the mean first passage time, you can compute this from the theory that you have, no? Do you see the same uh, comparison with the data? Uh, for the uh, mean and the standard deviation, yeah. yeah, this this curve this curve is from that same theory. No, this is done by Abuda Singh's group, and that that is the same expression. They, this theoretical curve is that only. 
Okay, so the same thing you'll get get from your model. Yeah, because my theory and you know, their at the end of the day, we are sure, producing sure. what they produced and little bit extra. But in a different uh, way. <laughs> so, uh, but the other question that I had was that you said for zero degradation rate, you get this uh, non-monotonic dependence. Ah, uh, let me go to that. But I mean, what's the understanding you have physically? Uh, so let me just explain that to you. Uh, so uh, if you take negative feedback and uh, so the, you see this linear form that is there now mm. you see for the value i is equal to 800 the rate will become zero so that means that if you have negative feedback beyond some point and it is linear you are not going to produce any further proteins once you have reached 800 value okay mm -hmm. so that means the proteins will start from small number build up to 800 and stop there Okay, mm -hmm. if they are not getting degraded. Now, mm -hmm. since they are stopping, it's a kind of steady state, but it's a trivial steady state because the distribution is just a delta function. Mm -hmm. Okay, but because it has become like a steady state, because of the same reason that if ever you reach a steady state and you keep putting thresholds for the protein which is around that steady state, fluctuations will rise a lot mm -hmm. because the system finds it very difficult to reach there. Rates have become so small. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason mm -hmm. uh, that, that now you might wonder then, but that is pathological because mm -hmm. linear feedback, uh, you know, has these rates actually going to zero. But then if you take a hill function where the rates don't go to zero also, but the hill coefficient is very high. I am mm -hmm. showing that uh, this is the numerical, uh, you know, uh, noise uh, versus threshold. So in fact, there also you will see an upturn simply because of the reason that although not zero, the level of the protein production, I mean, the rate of the protein production has become extremely small. As a mm. result, you have this sort of quasi steady state kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so hence a slowing down. And this mm. is, uh, you know, in the literature, every uh, before this, I did not see because people would say without degradation, how can you even have a noise reversal? That's not, but uh, we are just pointing out that, you know, there may be for uh, if the parameters are, uh, you know, quite uh, strongly skewed. But uh, it may not be of that practical importance. I couldn't uh, know whether, you know, the real proteins in the cells would follow any of these kind of, um, you know, negative feedback formulas. But if okay. they do, then this kind of thing may be, may be seen is the statement. Okay. A brief comment to both you and Roop. Uh, I and Shashi have been playing with some uh, experiments on the, at the colony level, looking at reinfection and uh, spreading of infection in the, in the colony. So maybe we can discuss separately. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. That would be nice. Yeah. Okay, there is a couple of questions in the chat box. Huh. So suppose I have an experimental data with bar graph, which is discrete, how to convert it into continuous data uh, fit to Gaussian? Well, uh, how to convert it to, uh, you don't convert it. If you are fitting it with a Gaussian, you just put, if you know the mean and the variance, you put the Gaussian on top of it. And uh, well, I mean, you can sort of see how much the data deviates from these. So there is this, uh, you know, there is a reference in our paper. You can see, uh, you can actually see that a fitted data, how much it differs from the experimental data. You can do this uh, uh, least square minimization process that, you know, you can do square of the differences, sum them up and then see when such a quantity will be minimized. Then you can talk of, uh, you know, the best uh, approach of uh, the fitted card to this. If that answers your question is what I would say. And then the next question, what is the final condition for solving the uh, backward uh, equation? Oh, so uh, not final condition, the different conditions that are there. One is the boundary condition that the survival probability for the protein level to be X and above is zero. That's the boundary condition. Because you know, if, once you reach X, you cannot survive or X plus one, you cannot survive. So that's the boundary condition. Now there is the initial condition also, which is that the S uh, at t is equal to zero for any x between zero to x minus one is one. Because you know, you at t is equal to zero, you are surviving. So survival probability is one. So with these two conditions and the differential equation, it can be solved. Also, sir, uh, the, sometimes in the discrete approach, uh, yeah. 
the formulation is used and sometimes uh, our continuous modeling methods where uh, uh, this uh, you have mentioned where you have calculated this to be three probabilities can you please explain uh, the more like when there is a little uh, you know intersection between discrete approaches and continuous modeling approaches because one is quite different from the other because of the nature of the variable being involved Right. So, so on the slide so, where you have a calculated right. probability or something, Again, where you uh, are explaining. Maybe it's best for me to return to this uh, um, this sort of uh, sunny easy yes. uh, uh, thing. Yes. Uh, and uh, you see, um, if you actually look at this discrete form n plus one p n plus one yes. minus n p n, see the, when you go to this continuum, and uh, you know. it is not always very rigorously easy to go from discrete to continuum let me tell you and that is why you know uh, master equations are kept as like jump processes and uh, you know uh, there are certain criteria in stochastic literature when you can go smoothly from uh, a, a discrete master equation to a fokker planck equation otherwise you cannot always do it but let us say that those mathematical criteria are satisfied in that case this discrete term simply speaking you see this is a di uh, discrete difference of what is written at the bottom it is x into p whose derivative is being taken okay so that way and then if you see this upper uh, formula here the first term was some uh, exponentially distributed burst rates multiplying the probability and if you look at this new in the lower formula new is exponentially distributed okay so it's just that the discrete geometry goes over to the exponential so there is a one to one correspondence actually provided the smoothness of the stochastic process is there that you can still go from a fokker planck to a master equation approach which i am saying rigorously is not possible for every case but in these cases it is possible and uh, let me just you know i did not intend to show you but uh, uh, i have a slide just you know this is the backward equation equivalent of uh, what we have as the discrete equation but um, you know we are working on various aspects of it we have only solved it for gamma equal to 0 but and uh, this is the in fact the continuum answer and the discrete can go over to the continuum that also that is so they bend to just and one also the discrete sorry go ahead yes okay also the discrete uh, jumps are not uh, uh, are not supposed to be just unity they can be having any integral uh, any integer number right yes. uh, as you have shown the protein uh, yes. is jumping Because from the like any like b the, divided by b plus 1 to the power r uh, that kind of thing hmm. so r is the any number that okay. can, only their size hmm. average is b average size is b. okay yeah okay thank you sir uh when experimentalist you know compares with whatever you know or rather does the experiment rather uh so they do they measure the intensity of the fluorescence or something of these proteins or some something else there was is the i would assume so but i don't at this moment remember the exact uh, so this nature paper i read very quickly and uh, i must say that i have forgotten actually what because exactly they case, do what is the protocol uh, because yeah. in that case in it's basically the uh, you know concentration level that will give rise to higher intensity or lower intensity right so right continuum right. and discrete would not matter much because ultimately it is all converted to right right and i think for them that is why they are uh, much more interested in the continuum approach because there is a kind some kind of lump so yeah. they, they that is why sanizis group initially wrote just a continuum equation because the, for them the concentration is what matters essentially okay, okay. yeah Okay so uh, if there is no more question wonderful talk